Peace and love, black family. Peace and love, black family. This is the Prince of Pan-Africanism, the notorious RBG, the most requested black scholar in the world, Dr. Umar Johnson, your personal certified school psychologist and doctor of clinical psychology. This is my first Facebook Instagram live in quite some time. I was banned from Facebook and I was also prevented from uploading on Instagram. So in the new year, my plan is to send all of my videos through my website, drumarjohnson.com, which is under construction. So make sure you thumbnail the website because I'm gonna start directing everything through the website since these European platforms keep on banding me and shutting me down for absolutely no reason at all. Also, let me say that so far, I will still be making the FDMG announcement on New Year's Day, January the 1st. I will be going live from Instagram and Facebook. So make sure you mark your calendars on New Year's Day. I don't know the time, but I'm just gonna pop up on you on New Year's Day, God willing to let you know where the first Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy will be. There's a small chance that uh, I may have to delay it a week or two. I'm hoping that's not the case so far. We're still on schedule for New Year's Day. Peace and love to all the brothers and sisters who came out yesterday here in Suffolk, Virginia to support our young African brothers and sisters in their concert. They did a tremendous job, a wonderful job, put on by the Temple Bethel congregation. Very, very powerful. Next stop is Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. You are next. Atlanta, Georgia. You are next. Tomorrow night, Shrine of the Black Madonna. Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard in Atlanta tomorrow, Saturday, December the 22nd, 7 p.m. program, doors at 6. I repeat, tomorrow in Atlanta, Shrine of the Black Madonna, 7 p.m., Saturday, December the 22nd in Atlanta, doors at 6, program at 7. I'm not going to keep you guys long today, but what I want to do is I want to briefly review this new President Trump bipartisan new crime bill known as the First Step Act. It is being celebrated in the popular media as some sort of a saving grace for mass incarceration, and it is not. What you have here is akin to President Obama's uh, My Brother's Keepers Act which really didn't have any protein in it, just a lot of empty carbohydrates. And just like President Obama's um, My Brother's Keeper initiative was filled with a bunch of useless nonsense and wrote really only threw money at the problems facing young black males. As you can see, it's made absolutely no difference in the lives of black males. This first step act signed by President Trump is just like the Obama's Brothers Keepers Act. There's very little protein in this, but just a whole bunch 
of empty carbohydrates. Now, from the beginning, let me say this. The reason that this bill passed both houses of Congress with flying colors, the reason it was supported by both Democrats and Republicans, I mean, let's think about that for a minute. Let's think about that for a minute. When was the last time we had a crime bill that was supported by both the Democrats and the Republicans and that passed both the Senate and the House with flying colors? We would have to go all the way back to 1994. That's right. More than 20 years ago to the Bill Clinton's crime bill. Okay. And why did the Bill Clinton 1994 crime bill pass both houses of Congress with flying colors? You know why? Because everybody was happy that it was going to swell up the prisons more than ever before. Three major provisions of the Bill Clinton crime bill from 1994. Number one, it gave us mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug related offenses. Number two, OK, a mandatory federal three strikes in your outlaw. OK, get three felonies and you'll be in jail for the rest of your life. Number three, welfare to work. It forced a lot of poor and underprivileged, particularly single black mothers. It forced them off of welfare and into work. OK, and then on top of that, it paved the way for the criminalization of child support. The criminalization of child support was also an outcome of Bill Clinton's 1994 criminal uh, federal crime bill. So we know that whenever the Republicans and the Democrats get behind a crime bill, it's normally because it's going to hurt black people, not help black people. And the one thing Bill Clinton gave us in that 1994 crime bill was what, brothers and sisters? Midnight basketball. Midnight basketball. So after you created three strikes and you're out, after you created mandatory minimums from nonviolent drug related offenses, you then give us a midnight basketball program. And black politicians and the black bourgeoisie and black preachers celebrated Bill Clinton's crime bill. The only thing you got out of it uh, is a stereotypical, okay, run and jump Negro basketball program out of the Bill Clinton crime bill. That's what you got. Now, let's look at this new one, the First Step Act. You know why this was celebrated by both houses of Congress? You know why this passed with sweeping, uh, with, with flying colors? Is because it does really nothing. It does almost nothing to change the unfair criminal injustice laws in this country imposed against black people. That's why it passed. That's why it passed. There's no protein in this. So I'm only going to keep you guys for an hour today. I'm only going to keep you for an hour. But let's look at this. OK, I'm going to go through it. Let's go through it. See, black people have a bad habit of celebrating victories that are not even victories. Every time a law gets passed and somebody says this is good for you, we automatically say this is good for us without reading the fine print. But I have the fine print. I have the fine print. I'm not listening to CNN. I'm not listening to Don Lemon. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey has to say about it. Okay? I'm not waiting for Conan O'Brien. Okay? I don't need a Soledad to tell me whether or not this is good. We have to read for ourselves. Stop letting other people interpret your reality for you. Stop letting other people interpret your reality for you. Because when you let other people interpret your reality for you, they control your narrative. They control your narrative. If you're going to let the New York Times and the Washington Post and USA Today and the Philadelphia Inquirer interpret your reality, then you're giving them the right to control your narrative. We can afford that no more. This is the last year of our fourth century in America. Take a minute to think about what that means, brothers and sisters. This is our last year of our fourth century in America. Our first century under white oppression, mind you. We were here before, but I'm speaking of those of us, including myself, who are the descendants of enslaved Africans who were brought here as property on ships. That's what I'm talking about. For us, this is the last year of our fourth century. That's significant. 1619 to 1719. 
was our first century, 1719 to 1819, our second century, 1819 to 1919, our third century, and by the way, our most progressive century, 1819 to 1919, the birth of Frederick Douglass to the rise of Marcus Garvey. 1819 to 1919, the birth of Frederick Douglass to the rise of Marcus Garvey was our most progressive century, okay, in the diaspora since our fall from prominence in Africa. And then the last century, 1919 to 2019. And I don't know what the hell this is. I don't know what the hell this is. But this is the last year of the African in America's fourth century, 2018, our last year. So we got to do some serious house cleaning, some serious soul searching, some serious, some serious narrative changing, and some serious relationship assessments. We need to review our relationship with the Democratic Party. We need to review our relationship with the black church. We need to re review our relationship with the black businesses, the United States government. We need to renew our relationship with God. We need to renew our relationship with each other, with the ancestors. The black man and the black woman need to review and assess our relationship with each other. Okay? We can't go into 2019 the way we're leaving 2018. We can't go into 2019 the way that we're leaving 2018. So let's get into this. Stop celebrating empty victories. When you celebrate an empty victory, when you celebrate an empty victory, what you do is you give the government an opportunity to take a break. You did this with Obama eight years ago. You did this with Obama eight years ago. You did this with Obama eight years ago. A so-called black president gets into the White House and black people celebrate. What are you celebrating? Did you read Obama's program? Did you read Obama's agenda? Did you study the fine print? No, you celebrated it. Why? Because the black bourgeoisie said it was a victory. Right now, you're celebrating the First Step Act. Why? Because the black bourgeoisie said it was a victory. Stop allowing the black bourgeoisie to be your intellectual filter. Stop letting the black bourgeoisie be your intellectual filter. No one should interpret your reality but you. No one should interpret your reality but you. Let's go through it. Let's go through it. Washington, D.C., I will see you Friday. Washington, D.C., I will see you Friday. December 28th, Thurgood Marshall Center. Doors at 5, program at 6. Vendors will be in the building in Washington, D.C. Kwanzaa Friday, December the 28th, doors at 5, program at 6. Dallas, Texas, we not canceling. Dallas, Texas, you will see me. Dallas, Texas, you will see me. Sunday, December 30th, Dallas, Texas, first visit in almost four years, last lecture of the year is going down at the Texas Theater in Dallas, four o'clock, doors at three, next Sunday, December the 30th. Dr. Umar's last lecture of the century, the last lecture of the quadricentennial will be in Dallas, Texas at the Texas Theater, 4 o'clock. Tickets, drumarjohnson.eventb.com. drumarjohnson.eventb.com. Donate to the school, FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 6872, Philadelphia, PA, 19132. General donations for Dr. Umar's work, my travel, my other programs, expenses. You can donate through the Cash app, cash.me slash dollar sign Dr. Umar Johnson cash dot me slash dollar sign you are D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson let's talk about it so what do we see first and I'm reading from the Federal Register I'm reading from the Federal Register provides for increased programs designed to reduce recidivism that's re-entry into prison Pro provides for programs designed to reduce recidivism and provides incentives for participation in these programs. Programs to reduce the cyclical nature of mass incarceration. Let's, let's stop right there. They're going to pay for programs to keep black men from going back into prison. 
So I have a question to the United States Congress. I have a question for President 45. President 45, are you putting money into livable wage jobs for black men and women when they come out of prison so they don't recidivate? That's my question. How much money are you putting into the labor force? Livable wage, not McDonald's, not Burger King. Those are jobs for our youth. Those are jobs for our youth. Those are not jobs for men and women in their 40s and 50s with three, four, five kids. What kind of money are you putting into the jobs that you claim? You're saying you want to stop recidivism. You're claiming you want to stop recidivism. So if you want to stop us from going back into prison, that means you're going to create jobs for black people. Show me the damn jobs. Show me the damn jobs. I'm not playing with y'all in the new century. I'm not taking this crap into the new century with me. How much money is actually going to go into jobs to hire black men and black women? That's my question. That's my question. Recidivism. You know why so many black people go back into jail? Because they got to commit crimes to put food on the table. They have to commit crimes to put clothes on their babies' backs. They got to commit crimes because the homeless shelters are spilling over. They're overfilled and they don't want their babies sleeping on the street. So they go to armed robbery. They go to armed robbery. They start stealing cars. They start hustling credit cards. This is what they do. They get into vandalism and burglary to do what? Feed their family. Most crime is economically motivated. What are y'all going to do about that? I didn't see nothing about how much money is going to go into jobs. I didn't see nothing about business grants. I didn't see nothing about small business loans. So if you are serious about stopping recidivism and you know that all recidivism is based on economic de devastation, and desperation. All recidivism is based on economic devastation and desperation. So to the U.S. Congress, I ask you. To the Congressional Black Caucus who supported this, I ask you. Where are the grants and loans for brothers and sisters coming out of prison so they don't go back? You know what these programs are? These programs are nothing but ways to divert money to white nonprofits. These programs are nothing but ways to divert money to white nonprofits. It's called nepotism. It's called nepotism in the name of saving black people. Oh, yes. President 44, Hussein Obama. President 44, Hussein Obama did the exact same thing. He did the exact same thing. My brother's keeper did nothing but throw money at the program using black people and saving black boys as a diversion and distraction from President 44 giving money to white liberal nonprofit organizations so they can eat food and feed their families on the backs of black people disguised as help for us. That ain't nothing but free money for white nonprofits. That's nothing but free money for white nonprofits. Next, implements. Now they're bringing in the psychology and the eugenics. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Now they're bringing in the psychology and the eugenics. If you're having trouble on Instagram, go to Facebook, Dr. Umar Ifatunde. If you're having trouble, my Instagram family, go to Facebook, Dr. Umar Ifatunde, I-F-A-T-U-N-D-E. All right? Now listen to this. Here's where the psychology in the eugenics is coming in. Implements a post-sentencing dynamic risk assessment to determine an inmate's risk of committing more crimes upon release from prison. Stay with me, brothers and sisters. See, this is the IQ test for prison. Remember, I told you the IQ test does not measure how intelligent black children are, but they love to come up with these predictive assessments. Pre We're going to predict how well you do in college. We're going to predict whether you can succeed on the workplace. We want to predict and predict that's eugenics. That's eugenics, determining a person's potential based off of a superficial 
pseudoscientific white psychological instrument. Okay? How are you going to predict his risk of selling more drugs? How are you going to predict her risk of committing more crime? You can't predict nobody's risk of committing crime when they get out, except for the fact that you're not going to give them a job. That's how you predict it. No job, they will come back. You don't need no damn tests. This is bogus crap. This is bogus crap. Let's read it again. Implements a post-sentencing dynamic risk assessment. And you know how they love to create words. They love to create words. What is the definition of power? The definition of power is to define someone's reality and make them accept it. So they're going to create a dynamic risk assessment. Here we go. Another worthless useless, racially biased psychological test. Another worthless, useless, racially biased psychological test. Another worthless, useless, racially biased psychological assessment. We're going to implement a post-sentencing dynamic risk assessment system to determine an inmate's risk of committing more crimes. Guess what, brothers and sisters? This doesn't help us because they never had that before. They never had that before. This is going to hurt because now they're going to bring in the white psychologists. Here we go. Here we go. Eugenics, population control. Here we go. Demonizing the African mind. Here we go. They're going to bring the white psychologist in and the white psychologist is going to sit down with your father, sit down with your uncle, sit down with your brother, sit down with your cousin, sit down with your nephew. And they're going to ask them a whole bunch of tests. Come take these tests. We have some questions we would like for you to answer. OK, this is what I do for a living. Certified school psychologist, 20 year master. We want you to answer some questions. And then after they answer the questions, they're going to score them and they're going to do what? Interpret the data. And they're going to come back and say, based on our dynamic risk assessment for your potential for committing more crimes, you earned a score of a 95. That's very significant. And because you earned a score of a 95 on this racially biased, pseudoscientific, worthless, useless, culturally insensitive, glow in the dark, X-Men, Black Panther, Superman, Batman, Caveman, Lord of the Rings as tests. You cannot go home. We have to keep you for five more years. Mark my words. I promise you this so-called dynamic risk assessment, okay, for determining whether or not they're going to commit more crime is going to work against our brothers and sisters getting out. Mark my words. Now, let me ask you a trivia question. For those of you who have studied and followed me through the years, what is the relationship between your SAT score and your ability to finish college? What is the relationship between your MCAT score and your ability to finish med school? What is the relationship between your GRE score and your ability to finish grad school? What is the relationship between your LSAT score and your ability to finish law school? Guess what? The predictive validity of those tests is almost a zero. The predictive validity of those tests is almost a zero. The predictive validity, validity of those tests is almost a zero. So can I ask you a question? Can I ask you all a question? If the predictive validity of every single test in America is almost a zero, useless predictability, useless predictability, if nearly, if every psychological instrument used has almost no predictive validity, can you please explain to me how this new dynamic risk assessment is going to predict your risk for committing more crimes? Explain it to me, it can't. So why is that in there? This is a little trick, 
a little glitch that they're putting in the system. So if they don't want somebody to get out of jail, they'll just have the psychologist come and do their dynamic risk assessment and keep their asses in. That's what that is. That's what that is. That's what that is. If you're having trouble on Facebook, go to Instagram. If you're having trouble on Facebook, go to Instagram. Let's go to the next one. Establishes eligibility criteria for and incentives for participation in evidence-based recidivism reduction. Time out. Wait a minute. Criteria and incentives for your participation in evidence-based recidivism reduction. Evidence-based means research has been done and has proven that these things, if they are done, will reduce the likelihood that these people will come back to jail. Evidence-based recidivism reduction. Can I ask you a question? If America has some evidence-based recidivism reduction strategies, then why does the United States incarcerate more people than any other country in the world? Explain to me if you have evidence-based recidivism reduction strategies, why do you have more people in prison than any other country in the world? This is the so-called land of the free and home of the brave, but you incarcerate more people per capita than any other nation on earth, but you have evidence-based recidivism reduction. Can we please learn what these strategies are? Because if they worked, why in the hell is your prison population continuing to grow? Explain it to me. Here we go again with them using words that don't mean anything. Here we go again with them using words that don't mean anything. Evidence-based recidivism reduction. For my special education parents, for my special education parents, how many of you been at meetings where they said we're going to use evidence based instructional strategies to improve your child's reading skills? Special ed parents, how many times you've been at a meeting where they said we're going to use evidence based math strategies to improve your child's math skills? How many times have you heard them say we're going to use evidence? evidence-based ADHD strategies to help your child focus and concentrate in class? And how many of these so-called evidence-based strategies have actually benefited your child? None of them. None of them. The only reason why Donald Trump and the U.S. Congress passed this bill because it don't mean a damn thing. Thing. It was simply a way to placate blacks because we haven't had no laws passed for us, okay, since the Civil Rights Bill. So they said, give them Negroes something. Give them something. Just give them something so they can clap because God knows they're not going to read the fine print. Whatever the preachers and the politicians, a.k.a. the black bourgeoisie, whatever the preachers and the politicians, a.k.a. the black bourgeoisie, tells them is a victory, they will treat it like it's a victory. But let's keep going. Establish eligibility criteria and incentives for participation in evidence-based recidivism reduction programs by allowing prisoners to earn time credits for pre-release custody. So if, if the inmate participates in these evidence-based recidivism reduction programs, they're going to earn Credits for pre-release custody, okay? For example, a prisoner may earn 10 days of time credit for every 30 days of successful participation in a recidivism reduction program or other eligible activity. However, however, only prisoners classified as minimum or low risk. See, here's the blue, here's the fine print. I'm reading. However, only prisoners classified as minimum or low risk may redeem these time credits 
to reduce their sentence. I don't think you just heard what I said. Did anybody just hear what I just said? Did anybody hear what I just said? Did anybody hear what I just said? If you participate in these bogus as evidence-based recidivism reduction programs while you in jail, they will take 10 days off of your sentence for every 30 days that you serve. So let me ask you a question. I have a 20 year bid for cocaine distribution charges, 20 years. I participate in this bogus recidivism reduction program, right? I got a 20 year sentence. So for every 30 days I serve, they're going to take 10 days off my sentence. So let's say I do this for two years. Two years straight, right? That's 24 30-day periods, right? So 24 30-day periods times 10 days is 240 days. So if I do two full years of the recidivism reduction program and I got a 20-year sentence, guess how much time comes off my sentence? 240 days. I don't even get a whole year off. For two years participation, I don't even get a year off. And then wait, wait, wait. However, prisoners, only prisoners classified as minimum or low risk may redeem their time credit. So if you are not minimum or low risk, you can't even turn that in to get your time. Are y'all listening to me, brothers and sisters? Just like the 13th Amendment, just like the 13th Amendment, we're going to give you this. Slavery shall not be legal in these states and territories, right? Slavery is over in the first sentence. And then in the second sentence, it comes right back and says, except, except as punishment for crime. They're doing the same thing here. Neanderthal double talk. Neanderthal double talk double talk okay so you do all this time and then you say okay i done did five years of this recidivism reduction program five years y'all owe me 480 days off my sentence and then they come and say we're sorry you are not minimum or low risk and because you are not minimum or low risk you cannot redeem your 10 days off for every 30 days served to reduce your sentence. And guess what they don't tell you? Who decides if you are minimum or low risk? Who interprets your risk assessment? Let's go back up. We have the dynamic risk assessment system. See how they play games with us? They make you think they're gonna help you and then they stick something in and say, wait a minute, the psychologist has to evaluate you. The psychologist needs to evaluate you. And after the psychologist reevaluates you, determine your risk. So one psychologist, one person, one person can say he's moderate risk to reoffend. He's maximum risk to reoffend. And just because of what one person said, all that time you served in that phony ass recidivism reduction program goes right out the window, brothers and sisters. Stop celebrating laws until you read the fine print. Stop celebrating laws until you read the fine print. 1964 Civil Rights Bill. 1964 Civil Rights Bill. Okay? No discrimination against people of color, people of color, pe black people. Celebrate. Then they said, but you've got to include women, gender, and sexual orientation. Gender and sexual orientation. And behind gender and sexual orientation, everything we fought for went to other communities. Let's keep on going. So, in addition to the exclusion, preventing all but those classified as minimum or low risk. Let me read that again. I hope you're listening. In addition to the exclusion, 
preventing all but those classified as minimum risk. Did you hear what I just said? What did I just say? Everybody is excluded from benefiting from this incentive unless you are classified as minimum or low risk. So let me ask y'all a question. How many black folks in federal prison are classified as minimum or low risk? I ask you again, how many black folks in federal prison are classified as minimum or no risk? So let's keep going. In addition to the exclusion, preventing all but those classified as minimum or low risk from redeeming time credit the bill makes it clear that violent and high-risk criminals convicted of certain serious offenses are ineligible for pre-release custody programs. Violent, I can understand the violence. I can understand the violence to an extent because some of them are wrongfully convicted. So you can't just say violent offender because you don't know how many violent offenders took a plea bargain. You don't know how many violent offenders were innocent but couldn't afford adequate representation. So don't just say all violent offenders should be removed because you don't know if they were guilty. You don't know if they were guilty. But this says if you're violent, not only violent, but it also says high risk criminal. Here we go again. Neanderthal definitions. Here we go again. Neanderthal definitions. What is a high risk criminal? You know what a high risk criminal is? Whatever the psychologist says they are. That's what it is. So if you are violent or high risk criminal convicted of certain serious offenses, you are ineligible for pre-release custody programs. This includes those convicted of crimes relating to terrorism, murder, sexual exploitation of children, espionage, violent firearm offenses, or those that are organizers, leaders, managers, supervisors, in the fentanyl and heroin drug trade. Prisoners are also ineligible to apply time credit if subject to a final order of removal under the Immigration and Nationality Act. Let's keep going. Preparing inmates for successful return to society provides more meaningful employment and training programs for inmates by expanding federal prison industries program. Did y'all hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? You got to read between the lines. Listen, let's break it down. Let's listen to the first part. The first part provides more meaningful employment and training programs for inmates, right? So first you say that's not too bad. More meaningful employment, okay? And training, that, that sounds okay. Let, let's listen, let's listen. Then listen to the second. By expanding federal prison industries. How much money do inmates make? 95 cents an hour? A dollar 10 cents an hour? 35 cents an hour? If the prison industries haven't been helping black folks up until now, what in the hell are they gonna learn in the prison industry that's going to help. Now let me show you the Machiavellianism in this. Let me show you the Machiavellianism in this. You know what this is called? This is called we're going to expand the prison labor force so we can get more contracts from rich white corporations who want to pay us big money so that we can pay black inmates low wages to manufacture their goods behind prison walls. I hope you heard what I just said. They're going to use that as a justification to call Bill Gates up and say, hey, Microsoft, 
Hey, Microsoft, you got anything you need made by prisoners? We got more prisoners working now. We got this new First Step Act. We got 50,000 more prisoners who can work for less than minimum wage. We can make your computers. We can make your, your hard drives. We can make your monitors. How much are you willing to pay us? They hustling in the name of criminal reform. They are hustling, brothers and sisters. They are hustling our people in the name of criminal reform. Let me read it one more time. This is why you got to have your third eye open. Provide more meaningful employment and training opportunity for inmates by expanding the federal prison industries program. Did you hear what I just said? They're going to make more black men and women work for a dollar an hour so Microsoft can get rich, so Walmart can get rich, so all the companies that rely on prison labor can make more money. But now it looks like they're helping poor black men and women learn valuable skills that they can use when they get out of jail. Are you serious? Are you serious right now? Are you serious right now, brothers and sisters? Requires the Bureau of Prisons to submit a report and evaluation of the current pilot program to treat heroin and opioid abuse through medication. Are y'all listening to this? They're going to bring drugs into the prison. They're going to bring drugs into the prison to help drug addicts get off of drugs. Does that make any sense to you? They're going to bring drugs into the prison to help heroin and opium and opioid abusers eliminate their addiction. No drug has ever stopped anybody from using another drug. No drug can heal you from a drug addiction. Let me say it one more time. No drug can heal you from a drug addiction. Let me say it one more time. No drug can heal you from a drug addiction. Let's keep going. Listen to this. If you have grandparents in prison, listen to this. If you have elderly in prison, listen to this. Extends the compassionate elderly release provision. Extends the compassionate elderly release provision from the Second Chance Act that allows the prisoner to request elderly inmates it allows them to request for his or her compassionate release if he or she meets the requirements set out in the law they can request for a compassionate release what the fuck is a compassionate release do you know what that means if the person is elderly they don't have a right to be released. There's no set of protocols that must be followed to make sure they get a release. They just simply say they can ask white folks. I'm an old woman. I'm an old man. Can you please let me out of prison so I can go and spend my last days with my grandchildren? It doesn't say that. It doesn't, that's what it, it, why does it have to be compassionate? Why not add language that requires the prison review board to consider the release of people over a certain age if they've had good conduct and have already served a certain amount of time? Why not guarantee it? Brothers and sisters, are you with me? Brothers and sisters, are you with me? Brothers and sisters, are you with me? Are you following me? Am I being extreme just by saying Donald Trump in the U.S. Congress should have said, listen, 
anyone 65 years of age or older, 65 years of age or older, who has already served one or two years, automatically must be brought before the prison review board. And if they have had no offenses in prison, if they have had no offenses in prison and they are 65 and older, it is required that they be prepared to be released. Why not make it mandatory? Why not make it automatic? What in the hell is a compassionate release request? Can somebody explain to me what is a compassionate release request? If Facebook is acting up, go to Instagram. If Facebook is acting up, go to Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. What is a compassionate? That's bull crap. This is Neanderthal language for saying we're not going to do anything about old black people in jail. We're not going to do anything about old black people in jail. We're not going to do anything about old black people in jail, but we're just going to make it look like we care. We're just going to make it look like we care by having them ask for a compassionate release. You can already do that. You don't need language for that. You can already make a compassionate request. Nobody's stopping you from making a compassionate request. People do it to the judge every day. Every day, black people are begging the judges of America to reduce their sentence. Every single day, we are making compassionate requests. So what the hell did they need to add this in? Tricknology in manipulation, insulting your intelligence, making you think they care about elderly blacks in jail just because they mention them. No damn compassionate requests. It should have been mandatory and obligatory that all elders in prison who have served one year should automatically be brought before the prison review board if they've had no infractions. It should be mandatory. And the fact that they even put this in there tells us that they know they wrong. This tells us that they know they wrong. This tells us that they know they wrong. Let's keep going. Codifies the board of prison rules that generally prohibits the use of restraints on pregnant inmates. Here we go again. You can't put a restraint on a pregnant woman. That's the new law. You cannot put a physical restraint on a pregnant inmate. But, here we go again, double talk, but, except, here we go, you can't use restraints on pregnant inmates, except those who are in an immediate, incredible flight risk or threat of harm to herself or others. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to say. Did y'all just hear what I just read? Do you see the double talk? Did you hear it? Let's look. come on, brothers and sisters. Come on. Come on, y'all. Codifies the board of prison rules that generally prohibits the use of restraints on pregnant inmates. Except, except there's always an exception. There's always an exception when it comes to us. There's always an exception. So we're talking about pregnant women, except those who are in a, an immediate and credible flight risk. Who determines if a pregnant black woman is an immediate and credible flight risk? Who determines if a pregnant black woman is an immediate or credible flight risk? Who makes that determination? Can somebody ask me a question? A answer me a question. Brothers and sisters, I got a question for y'all. They're saying you can use the restraint if the pregnant woman is an immediate or credible flight risk. Can I ask y'all a question? What pregnant woman? Please help me out. Please help me out. Instagram, help me out, brothers and sisters. Instagram, help me out. Facebook, help me out. What pregnant woman do you know is an immediate flight risk? who can climb over the prison bars, crawl through the tunnels, jump over the barbed wire with an orange jumpsuit. What pregnant woman do you know 
is going to risk hurting her baby to engage in something. She can't run from the cops. Who's she going to run from? Who's she going to? She's pregnant. What pregnant woman is a flight risk? What the hell are they talking about? What pregnant woman is a flight risk? Somebody help me out. What pregnant woman is a flight risk? And then it says, or if she is a threat to do harm to herself or others. What pregnant woman can beat down a guard or another inmate pregnant? I mean, I know early trimester, first trimester maybe, but come on. That's not even real. Here we go again. So with the elders, they didn't. They didn't. Them. And now with our pregnant women, they didn't do nothing for them either. This ain't nothing but 13th Amendment language. This ain't nothing but 13th Amendment to the Constitution language. No more slavery except if you commit a crime. You see that? You see that? Compassionate elderly release. If they ask for it, they might get it. They might get it. They can ask for it, but there's no guarantees. Pregnant woman cannot be put in physical restraint unless... She's a flight risk or a risk of doing harm to somebody else. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Let's keep going. Man, now listen to this one. This one going to blow your mind. Get ready for this one, y'all. I am, this is Dr. Umar Johnson, live in Virginia, and I am reviewing the key provisions of the new federal First Step Act, the new crime bill. The largest and most major crime bill that we've gotten since Bill Clinton's 1994 crime bill. That's what this is. 94 to 04 to 14 is 20 years. We're almost 25 years. We waited 25 years for this garbage. We waited 25 years for this. 25 years for this is what we're waiting for. And you got black folks running around talking about we got some justice. You know why? Because they want to stop your revolution. They want to stop your revolution. And the only way they can stop your revolution is to make you believe in the democratic process. They stopped your rev revolution with Obama. They stopped your revolution with the Civil Rights Bill. They stopped your revolution with the Voting Rights Act. And now they want to stop your revolution with the First Step Act. They said, we better give black folks something. You better give them something because they ain't got nothing in a long time. Barack Obama ain't do nothing for black folks. All his laws was for other people. So we better give them something. Listen to this one. This one really going to make you laugh. Mandates that inmates be housed. Listen, this is dealing with when they send out people far away from their homes. This is dealing with when they send out people far away from their homes. This is dealing with when they send people far away from their homes. Listen, mandates that inmates be housed no more than 500 miles from the prisoner's primary residence. So they're saying you cannot, federal only, not state. This is not state. This is not county. This is only federal. And of course, federal inmates are only 10% of all inmates. So this don't even apply to you unless you in fed. Let me clarify, brothers and sisters. Let me clarify, brothers and sisters. This is not state. This is not county. This is only for those 10% of inmates who are in federal custody. If you are not in federal custody, what Dr. Umar is talking about does not matter to you. Everybody got me. This is fed time only. So it's saying mandates inmates be housed no more than 500 miles from the prisoner's primary residence and grants authority for prisoners to save money in an escrow account to be used for pre-release expenses such as transportation and housing. No more than 500 miles. No more than 500 miles. Can I ask y'all a question? Here they go, insulting your intelligence. So your husband, your wife, your friend, your loved one is locked up. And the new law says you can't be locked up more than 500 miles, right? So let me do a little something. Let me do a quick map quest from Southern Virginia to Philadelphia, where I am now. I'm driving back to Philadelphia. Let's see how many miles it is. 
I'm driving back. You're ready to roll. Okay. Drive safe. Guess what? I am 300 miles from Philadelphia. A six hour drive. I am 300 it's miles from Philadelphia. Miles a roundabout. six hour drive. I am 300 miles from Philadelphia. A six hour drive. This says 500. This says 500. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? They are saying that the prisoner can be locked up. Okay? A 10 hours drive away from where they live. Can somebody please explain to me how that is progress? Can somebody please explain to me? Okay? Can somebody please explain to me how being locked up 10 hours from your house is progress? Help me. I'm going to wait. I need an answer. I need an answer. Again, this is saying that you cannot be locked up more than 500 miles from your primary address. You cannot be locked up more than 500 miles from your primary address. You cannot be locked up more than 500 miles from your primary address. 500 miles is about 10 hours. 10 hours. So if I live in Philadelphia, I could be locked up 10 hours away in Indiana. That's progress. That's pro I could be locked all the way up in upstate Michigan if I live in Philly. That's progress. 500 miles is the best y'all could do. 500 miles is the best that y'all could do with this fake crime bill. Are you serious? Let's keep going. Clarifies the formula by which the Board of Prisons calculates good time credit for good behavior in line with the original congressional intent. Under current law, prisoners can earn up to 54 days per year for good behavior in prison. So right now in a federal prison, you can earn up to 54 days off your sentence per year, which I think is sad. They given us 30 year sentences. They given us 20 year sentences, even five and 10 year sentences. And all I can get is 54 years for every 365, excuse me, 54 days off of every 365 days that I serve. That is sad. That is sad. And it does nothing to increase the minimum wage that they give prisoners. Notice you don't hear anything about an increase in the wage for prisoners. You don't hear anything about the increase in the wage for prisoners. Requires the director of the board of prisons to provide a secure storage area outside the secure perimeter for employees to store firearms or allow for vehicle lock boxes for firearms. What that got to do with us being in jail? I don't give a damn about no guns that the damn correctional officers own. What they need to bring their guns to work for? What they got to do with us? Why is that in here? What they got what what is that in here for? Okay? Somebody just said it. Tiffany Brown, excellent comment. Tiffany Brown on Facebook, excellent comment. Trump is really helping out his federal business partners. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Very perceptive and insightful observation. All this is going to do, okay, is put more black inmates to work slaving for white corporations, expanding the damn prison industries, expanding the prison industries and the prison industries ain't nothing but a caveat for corporations who want to use cheap labor. The prison industries ain't nothing but a caveat for rich white corporations who want to use prison labor to keep their expenses down. That's all that is. That's all that is. Brothers and sisters, I got another page, but I'm not going to be able to get to it right now. I'm going to save it for later. I have another page, but I can't get to it now. I want to conclude today's seminar by saying, brothers and sisters, we are going to have to fight for equality because that ain't it. 
we are going to have to fight for justice because that ain't it. We're going to have to fight for equity because that ain't it. We're going to have to fight for fair play because that is not it. When I make my announcement, when I make my announcement about the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, which I hope will be New Year's Day, when I make that announcement, brothers and sisters, y'all better be ready. Y'all better be ready because it's going down, brothers and sisters. It's going down. I will be reinitiating Team Pan-African, the international movement for the independence and protection of African people. From within the walls of FDMG, I will be reigniting the National Independent Black Parent Association within the walls of FDMG. I'm looking for serious brothers and sisters. I'm not looking for Facebook addicts. I'm not looking for Instagram addicts. All those brothers and sisters who y'all love and follow, who y'all call leaders who ain't led nobody no damn where. All those brothers and sisters who sit up on Facebook all day long, monetizing conscious rhetoric for YouTube dollars. All those brothers and sisters who sit on YouTube all day long, monetizing conscious rhetoric for YouTube dollars. They're, use they're useless. They don't care about you. Not one of them is doing anything of substance to help you. None of them. They're just addicted to being seen and YouTube pays them for their addiction. They're just addicted to being seen and YouTube pays them for their addiction. I'm looking for workers. I'm looking for workers. I'm looking for sisters who want to help me put together this international conference for the black woman that will be held within the walls of FDMG. I'm looking for serious black women. Not petty black women, not black women who like to gossip about other black women, not sisters who want to steal other sisters men, not sisters who got black skin supremacy problems, not sisters who got light skin supremacy problems, but real, authentic, unapologetically African women. That's what I'm looking for to help me put on this international conference of the black woman. I'm looking for serious black men, strong black men who want to help me put on this international conference for the black man. We're going to put on the first international conference for the African, Pan-Africanisms, Pan-African nationalists. We're going to do that. 1920 is the, is the centennial anniversary of the right Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey's first international convention held in New York City. August of 1920 to August of 2020, we will be hosting at the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. Mark your calendars now. Mark your calendars now. August of 2020, we will be holding the centennial first international convention of the Pan-African revolutionaries of the world in the walls of FDMG. I hope you're ready. I'm not hitting nobody up. You hit me up. I'm not looking for you. You look for me. I'm an organizer. I don't have to search you out. You search me out. That's how this goes. I don't hit nobody up. You hit me up. But it's going down. The announcement is coming, New Year's Day, FDMG, and where the school will be, where the school will be, will serve as international headquarters for Team Pan-African, international headquarters for the NIBPA, international headquarters for the independent African-centered school and homeschool network. I will be hosting an annual homeschool and independent school conference. Much respect to CB, Council of Independent Black Institutions. I will work with you. I respect what y'all have done, your legacy. I will work with you, but I still reserve the right to do my own thing. I still reserve the right to do my own thing. UNIA ACL, I will always be a member of the UNIA ACL. It's the movement of Marcus Garvey, but I still reserve the right to do my own thing under Team Pan-African. It is a new century. It is a new year. It is time for a new mindset, a new movement, a new mission, and a new manifestation of African glory. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. I'm ready for work. I'm looking for workers. Y'all just want to sit on YouTube and talk about the problem. Y'all ain't fixing nothing. Where are the workers? Is everybody addicted to YouTube? All I see is people making YouTube videos about the problem. Nobody's solving the problem. It's time to solve. And where FDMG is going to be? And where FDMG is going to be is automatically, 
automatically the new black Wall Street of black America. Brothers and sisters in the city where I'm coming, brothers and sisters in the city where I'm coming, y'all better be ready. Y'all don't even know who you are yet, but you better be ready. Because we ain't just building FDMG. We're going to make that city a role model. That city is going to be an example to black cities all across the world of what we can do. Hospital, grocery store, bank, distribution, factory, import, export, independent schools. We will be the Black Wall Street. So says the Honorable Marcus Garvey. So said the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Mr. Garvey said, where well, I go, the headquarters of the movement go. So where Dr. Umar go, the headquarters of the movement go. So where I go will become the international headquarters of Pan-African Revolution. That's facts. That's facts. So brothers and sisters, I bid you peace. Black power, good Garvey day. Atlanta, tomorrow night. Shrine of the Black Madonna, six o'clock. Washington, D.C., Friday night, Thurgood Marshall Center, 6 o'clock. Detroit, Michigan, Saturday night, Northwest Activity Center, 5 o'clock. Detroit, Michigan, Saturday, December the 29th, Northwest Activity Center, 5 o'clock. And last but not least, Black Texas, are you ready? Black Texas, are you ready? Black Texas, you will be my last lecture before black folks in America go into our fifth century of struggle in America. You're the last lecture of the year and you're the last lecture of the century. So I'm bringing the pain to Washington, D.C. in Dallas. I'm bringing the pain to the Texas theater on Sunday, December 30th. Get your tickets. Dr. Umar Johnson .com. If you need tickets for Atlanta and Detroit, if you need tickets for Atlanta and Detroit, you have to go to Canaansbuilders.eventbrite.com. Canaansbuilders.eventbrite.com. Canaansbuilders.eventbrite.com for Atlanta tomorrow night in December, excuse me, in Detroit Saturday night. That's a different site. Because it's not my event. I'm the speaker. I'm not the sponsor. I'm the sponsor in D.C. I'm the sponsor in Dallas. You get those tickets at Dr. Umar Johnson dot event B. Atlanta in Detroit is event bright. D.C. in Dallas is event B. Atlanta in Detroit is event bright. D.C. in Dallas is event B. Peace and black power family. The Prince of Pan-Africa.